morning. Great to be here, isn't it? Man. So, um, if you're a sports fan, this is the most exciting time of the year. Yo, know, March Madness, as Russ brought out, is uh, in the air. Um, this is not when talent is a premium. This is when heart is a premium. Oh, yeah. Yo, when unknown teams take on the heavyweights and they win the games. Uh, not so much with talent, but uh, because they have the heart of a warrior. Yo, the smallest team with the highest seed can take on the one of the largest teams with a number one seed. And when, you know, the Davids of the college basketball world can slay the Goliaths. You know, um, and it, it's really, it's, it's, uh, it's not about size and strength, but it's about heart. You know, Eisen, uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower said one time, he said, it, what counts is not the size of the dog in the fight. What counts is the size of the fight in the dog. And that's, uh, that's what we're seeing in March Madness. We're seeing uh, small dogs with a lot of fights. So this morning we're going to talk about having the heart of a warrior. And uh, we're going to study in the book of Luke. We're going to do a little, little Bible study in Luke. You guys hired up about that? Let's start over in Luke chapter 9. And you're right, I am not the, uh, the minister here. I'm not the preacher. Um, that would be Joel. So if, you know, if anything comes up and you, you disagree with anything, you want to talk to Joel. So, I'm only the messenger. Luke chapter 9 and verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them. But Jesus turned and he rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. You know, Jesus had a goal. His journey begins here in Luke chapter 9 and ends as he prays over the city in Luke chapter 19 and verse 41. And actually, he enters the city in, chapter, in, in Luke chapter 19 and verse 45. But uh, he was resolute. He was determined. Literally, the word resolute in, uh, in the Bible there means to literally fix one's face. He had his face fixed on getting to Jerusalem. He made the decision. It was final. Nothing was going to deter him. This goal, it drove him. Even though it, was ca- it, it would cause him great, uh, great joy, but exceeding anguish. Wow. Nothing was going to stop him from getting to Jerusalem. And he knew Jerusalem was the end. He knew that that's where his goal would be reached and his life's work would be realized. Did he feel like going? You know, knowing what would happen in Jerusalem, I'm sure there were times when he really wrestled with it. Um, But he knew he had to. You know, sometimes you don't always feel like accomplishing your goals. Ask those who have already left their dreams of January 1st. <laughs> right? Many don't feel like moving forward, and they give up. Because reaching goals can be painful. It can be hard work. You know, Michael Jordan once said, 
I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. On 26 occasions, I've been entrusted to take the game-winning shot, and I missed. I have failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Wow. You know, sometimes it just takes painful labor to reach a goal. But Jesus says here he resolutely set out. Nothing was going to stop him. And I imagine the, the uh, disciples, you know, asked him more than once, you know, why Jerusalem, Jesus? Why do you want to go to Jerusalem? I mean, why go to where the opposition is going to be the strongest? Why walk into the hottest fires of persecution? Why? Why would you do that? You know, success doesn't always look like success. Sometimes it looks like failure. But uh, through determination and through perseverance, it can turn into an incredible success. You know, Sikor Honda was a man behind the Honda Motor Company. And uh, before establishing the, the Honda Motor Company, he manufactured these little piston rings. And they were kind of brand new to the, uh, uh, to the, the, the industry. And uh, he had difficulty time getting people to buy his idea. But finally, he secured a contract with Toyota. Uh, Honda with Toyota, you know. But when he finally got the contract, World War II had started. And uh, shortly into World War II, a bomb came and blew up its factory. So what did he do? He just started building again. And uh, he built it up again. And then there was an earthquake that totally leveled his building again. <laughs> and, uh, but he never stopped. He never stopped innovating. And uh, he eventually created a little motor, motorized bicycle that became the precursor to the Honda motorcycle wow. that uh, ultimately the Honda car company that, uh, that we know today. Wow. Um, he never gave up. You know, Colonel Sanders, any of you guys like uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken? Yes, sir. Love them. The story of Colonel Sanders is very interesting. At 65 years old, right, Ed? 65 years old. He found himself bankrupt after his restaurant business failed. So he drove around in his car pleading with diners and restaurant owners uh, to use his fried chicken recipe. And uh, the deal was that for every piece of chicken they sold, he would get a nickel as commission. He was turned down over a thousand times before a restaurant agreed to use his recipe, which he, which he called Kentucky Fried Chicken. And now you know the rest of the story, right? right? 65 years old. The guy never gave up. That's impressive. Maybe you thought about giving up. You know, maybe you thought about throwing in the towel. Um, maybe you feel like you failed too much. The reality is that failure is not falling down. Yeah. Failure is not getting up again. Wow. Maybe you feel like the journey is just too difficult. And uh, the persecution is too hot. The opposition is too strong. Don't ever give up. No matter how challenging it gets, never give up. Up. Yeah. Perseverance will reap a reward, yeah. not only in this life, but in eternity. So why was Jesus going to Jerusalem? Well, Jesus reveals this through tears. Look in uh, Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, we're going to start in verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. This was actually the second time that he had wept over Jerusalem. And said, if you, even you, 
had only known on this day what, uh, uh, what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. These days, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Oh, man. You know, Jesus was going to Jerusalem for one reason. One reason. The salvation of people from a world of darkness and pain. That's the only reason he went to Jerusalem. In uh, Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Verse 10 there is considered by many theologians as the key verse of the book of Luke. Because it really expresses the heart of Jesus' ministry in both his work of salvation and his quest for the lost. You know, in Luke chapter 4, in verse 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and, recover, uh, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know, Jesus fought to save people. That was his goal. His crucifixion in Jerusalem was just a culmination of his journey. And uh, this is where the poor would hear the good news. This is where freedom would be proclaimed to the prisoners. This is where the blind would see and where the oppressed would be set free. What's your primary goal in life? What's driving you? What's a driving goal in your life? What are you determined to reach? And uh, one of my favorite questions is, where will you be when you get where you're going? Ooh, that's fire. If you're a disciple of Jesus, your goal is to win as many as possible. There is no other goal for the disciple of Jesus that's more important than that. To win as many as possible. And make no mistake about it. It's, uh, it's going to require a death. It's going to require dying to yourself. Look over in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Verse 21. It says, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my, dis my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it? For someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. We've got to take up our cross daily and follow him in suffering, in rejection, maybe someday in death. I'll tell you, the way things are going, it's becoming a lot more likely. Right, okay. Persecution in this country is going to get a lot hotter. Yeah. You know, you think uh, what we're going through right now is uh, is intense. I don't think it's anything like what we're going to see in the near future. Yeah. You know, we have to, uh, uh, we, we've got to stay focused on our goal. And uh, why do we need to suffer sometimes? Because our goal is the same as Jesus to save people from this dark, painful world. To open the eyes of the blind, set the oppressed free. You know, back in 1980, in Bozeman, Montana, my eyes were open. You know, um, and next year, 
<laughs> excitingly, next year we will be celebrating other men and women who have been set free in Bozeman, Montana. Like almost 45 years later. How exciting. But you know, when I was in Bozeman, when I arrived to Bozeman, I was like smoking everything I could get my, my hands on. I was drinking. I was a mess. You know, I'd left my beautiful, amazing, splendorificent girlfriend. And that's for you, Russell, wherever you are. Girlfriend in New York. My family was in the East. I didn't know anybody. I was lonely. I had just taken a trip across the country with this really weird guy who was, uh, who was all into black magic. And uh, so every day, it was, like the, it was like several days in a row, he would just, so what do you think about black magic? You know, the windshield is not clear. It's, it, you're seeing a different world. <laughs> and after about three days, it took me three days, but after three days, I just stopped the car and I said, you're out. <laughs> You're, you're going to be someone else's problem. <laughs> yeah, I thought I was doing this guy a favor, you know, but obviously not. Um, so I got to my dorm, Montana State University. I got to my dorm, and I told my RA, uh, you know, that uh, I was going to, uh, you know, what what he he actually approached me. He said, "So, uh, are you Roger Parlour?" I said, "Yeah." He said, well, I've got some bad news for you. I said, okay, what is it? He said, uh, you're going to be rooming with a cult member. Aww. And I said, what? I just left one. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? So I picked up my stuff. I walked down to my dorm room. I opened the door, and there was Jeff Clark. Jeff Clark changed my life. Wow. Jeff Clark studied the Bible with me. Jeff Clark uh, got me to open up about a lot of the stuff that was in my heart. And uh, my eyes were opened and I was set free. You know, since then, I've been able to influence many other people. Uh, not me, by the glory of God. You know, it was uh, because of Jeff Clark, though, he loved me enough to share with me. And then shortly after that, I met a guy named Ian McNeely. Now, Ian was, he was a great guy. He was like a hippie out of the 60s. This guy looks like he, he, he looked like he came right from Woodstock. And uh, I mean, long hair. He, he was, he was a hippie. But you know, I, uh, I met Ian. We studied the Bible and I became his Jeff Clark. Ian, a few years later, went to Stockholm on the mission team wow. and became Jeff Clark to many lost souls wow. in Sweden. Wow. He, called me, uh, he called me several, um, uh, several years after he had gone. And, uh, I, you know, I would kind of lost track of him. He called me up and he said, Roger? I said, yeah. He said, this is Ian. I said, Ian, how you doing? He said, I'm doing great. Uh, my, my family is faithful. I've got kids that are in the kingdom. Wow. I'm doing awesome. But I just wanted to call and thank you. Come on. Who is your Jeff Clark? Whose Jeff Clark are you? Come on. Whose life have you gotten into and changed? Guys, I think we need to regain the heart of a warrior here. Yeah. You know, we need to uh, we need to recommit ourselves to the goal. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing else will bring the joy and fulfillment that bringing someone, helping someone into the waters of baptism come will bring. On, on, you know, ask India, ask Thomas, <laughs> ask Marvell and Alexis, ask Joel and Courtney, ask anyone who has led somebody into the waters of baptism, and they'll tell you. There is nothing that's more exciting 
and rewarding than helping somebody to become a disciple. We need to have passion and the dream that Jesus had, uh, that we will stop at nothing to reach Jerusalem in our life. But, you know, we've got to battle through some obstacles because Jesus did. Jesus had to overcome many obstacles to reach his goal. He dealt with many of the same things we deal with. And when it comes to having a heart of a warrior, um, man, he had it. And he strove for that goal. But he had to fight through temptation. He had to be trained by rejection. And he overcame discouragement. Look over in Luke chapter 4. He fought through temptation. Luke chapter 4 and verse 1. says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. That makes sense, right? (laughs) The, uh, The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he, and said, he said to him, I will, I will give you all authority, authority and splendor. And splendor. It's, it's, been been me, me, it's been given me, it's been given to me, and I, and I can, can give it to anyone I want to. to. If, if you worship, worship me, it, it will all be yours. Mm. Jesus, Jesus answered, it is written, worship, worship the Lord your God and serve him, him only. And then then the the devil devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down here. For it's written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left them forever. No, he didn't. He left them for a more opportune time. You know, Jesus was tempted by the devil, just like we are, in every way. You know, even though he was full of the Spirit, even though he had just come down from a mountaintop experience in Luke, 4, in Luke 3, uh, 21 and 22, where the heavens were opened, And uh, the Holy Spirit descended on him, and the voice from heaven called out, You are my son, whom I love. With you I'm well pleased. Man, how encouraging, right? Wow. I would be pretty encouraged. Yet even after that amazing occasion, he was tempted. You know, guys, we can be tempted at any time. When things are going bad, and when things are going good. In fact, I think the times when Satan enjoys working the most is when things are going well. But a warrior always keeps their guard up. He knows the enemy is always right around the corner waiting for him to strike. Even over the last week, in trying to prepare for this, that Satan has been throwing me curveballs and has been trying... A lot of things to tempt me. Um, We've got to always be ready. So how did Satan tempt Jesus? Number one, he said, turn this stone into bread. Satan attacked him at his weakest point. He hadn't eaten for 40 days, and he was hungry. You know, Satan will hit us at our weakest points. He will hit us at the core desires in our hearts. Yo, if, you're, if your weak point is lust, that's exactly where he's going he's gonna to strike. We've got to resolve to be pure. If we don't resolve to be pure in every way, Satan will hit you right there. Compromise. If, uh, if your convictions are weak about being maybe being at every meeting of the body or giving the full tithe of your contribution or having quiet times every day, giving your whole heart to your brothers and sisters. If you're riding the fence on any of these convictions, that's where he's going to strike. Yeah. Laziness. Hello. 
If you're lazy and laid back, Satan will give you plenty of opportunity not to give your best. Pride. You know, if you're struggling with pride in your heart towards anybody or anything, Come on. that's one of Satan's specialties. Oh, the other yeah. specialty is deceit. Yeah. And uh, Satan is a liar and the father of lies. He will tell you that it's not important to be open. He'll say, you just minimize it. Rationalize it. Justify it. Justify your sin. Don't get open. Don't get honest. Guys, we've got to wage war on these things. We've got to get open and confess our temptations. You know, once you do that, you'll have no, Satan will have no power in these areas. And uh, listen, be as specific as you can when you open up. Don't give, just give a general idea of what you're uh, confessing. Really get specific. Radically battle through these unspiritual desires. You know, I really appreciate Tim. You know, Tim is, uh, Tim is battle tested. He is battle tested. He's battled through sin. He's come out victorious. And he's wide open with his struggles. Every evening. I challenge, I challenge some of you to do this. Every evening, he texts several guys. Every, I'm talking every evening. There has not been an evening in two weeks that Tim has not texted me or called me. And, and what he does is he, he shares his temptations and he shares his victories. He shares about his quiet times. He shares about the people he's reaching out to. That's commitment. That's a willingness to go to battle. That's how open and honest and vulnerable we need to be as disciples. The second temptation, I will give you all this. You know, the temptation of power and authority and control. You know, leaders have to be really careful with this. If you want to be a leader, you've got to go to battle with your pride. I'm talking about wanting leadership for the wrong reasons. Not been there. Um, wanting control, power, wanting people to look at me, wanting to be recognized. It's all about pride. Yeah. And we'll, we'll look at this a little later. And then the temptation for things, materialism, uh, like Tyrese was sharing this morning, wanting the bigger, the better, the newer. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Wanting the, the, the latest and greatest. Spending money that we don't have because we think we need the latest and the greatest. Uh, even willing to sacrifice the kingdom and our relationship with God for something that's just worthless. You understand that things are going to burn. You understand that everything is scheduled to burn. You understand that when you die someday, you're not taking anything with you. You understand that, right? There is nothing worth giving your heart and your life to. Man, I, 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 it, it, it kills me when, uh, when somebody buys a, a brand new, sparkly, shiny car, and uh, they've extended their 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 credit way too far because they've wanted this car. And I think, what a waste. Yeah. And you know why people do that? People do that because they give their heart to it before they give their brain to it. You want something, so you give your heart to it. And uh, no one can talk you out of it because your heart is already, your emotions are already involved. You're committed to it. That's right. The promise is uh, the promise in, in Matthew six thirty three still stands. You know, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and everything will be given to you as well. Everything you need will be given to you. Not everything you want, but everything you need. And then the third temptation: throw yourself down. You know, Satan challenge. 
Jesus' divinity, his identity. If you are the Son of God, and you know Satan does the same to us. If you are really the Son of God, look at how hard your life is. Does God really love you? Are you really saved? I mean, really, look at how many times you've blown it. (laughs) You really, you think think God is overlooking all that stuff? Or do you really have the Spirit? Yeah, why isn't God working in your life a little more? You know, I don't know. You may not have the Spirit of God. Look over in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You know, we are dearly loved children. If you're a baptized disciple of Jesus, you're saved, you have the Spirit, you're dearly loved. We are children of God. There's no no ifs on God's part. Uh, He took care of that on the cross. And God's promise remains firm. We can be secure in that. You can walk proudly, even through the the failures, even through the challenges and the difficulties. You can walk with your head high that you are a disciple of Jesus. Don't let Satan cause you to doubt that. Don't allow him to uh, question your identity. Up, bro. Come on. We've got to fight temptations to reach our goal. Number two, Jesus was trained by rejection. You know, most opposed, many opposed Jesus and his goal. The Pharisees were jealous of him. The Romans were afraid of him. Those who refused to love the truth hated him. You know, rejection is not a pleasant thing. <laughs> But we all face it. We all face it at at some point in our lives. And uh, it can come in various forms. It can come by being turned down for a job or a promotion. Um, It can come by rejection letter from a college. Or it can come from being rejected by someone you love. And uh, it hurts. It's painful. Without the heart of a champion, it will tear down your worth. And it will tear down your self-esteem and your confidence. But guys, it's not the end of the world. Rejection is not the end of the world. You know, in 2006, we went to Chicago to plant the church in Chicago. And uh, when I got there, I reached out to several people who I had known for years, expecting to connect with them. People I'd baptized and poured my life into. And uh, what did I get back? Nothing. No phone call. No, hey, it's great to hear from you. No, hey, can we get together soon? Nothing. It hurt. And for a moment, I was discouraged. I'll tell you what it did is it solidified my resolve. It uh, it made me all the more eager to reach out and uh, to love people. You know, I I determined that I was going to reach out uh, to more people until the door was shut. Um, God allowed it to train me. I allowed God to train me through it. We can fight rejection and come out stronger. You know, Sylvester Stallone said, I take rejection as someone blowing a bugle in my ear to wake me up to get going, rather than to retreat. Don't let the fear of rejection stop you. Let it train you. You know, um, you've got to acknowledge it, accept it. Uh, It's important that that you allow yourself to have those feelings and talk about them. You know, um, I had to remember that rejection can be an opportunity for growth and deepening my, my conviction. You know, I surrendered myself to positive people. And, uh, you know, that's the beauty of God's church is uh, I talked to people who had gone through a lot of the same things. 
And uh, I worked hard to keep a positive attitude and not give up. And number three, Jesus overcame discouragement. Look over in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 28. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, James, and John with him and went up into the mountain to pray. And he was, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They, they spoke about his departure, which he was try, about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but, they, uh, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving, Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what he was talking about. You know, these guys were almost asleep. And when they woke up, they had no idea what was going on. Yeah. His main guy wanted to build shelters. Absolutely clueless. They weren't getting it. But you know what? Jesus stuck with these guys. Yeah. He, he didn't give up on them. You know, we've got to stick with people. No matter how many times they blow it or make mistakes, we've got to believe in each other through thick and thin. Yeah. We must cons- commit ourselves to each other and never give up on people. Think about your life. Where would you and I be if, uh, if someone had given up on us? Where where we're at, because people never gave up on us. I've heard about and I've dealt with um, some of the squabbles going on in the church. You know, it breaks my heart when I hear about people that aren't getting along, people who are giving up on relationships. Guys, listen. Uh, if you have something against somebody, work it out today. Work it out today. Don't wait until tomorrow or later this week. Work it out today. This is not, not a, another nice religious group that uh, talks behind everybody's back and then uh, just pretends nothing's happening. This is, a, this is a congregation. This is a group of people. Uh, this is God's kingdom that deals with issues. If you have a problem with somebody, do not let Satan get a foothold. Don't give up on each other. You know, in in, uh, in verse 37 through 41, Jesus comes off the mountain of uh, transfiguration, a mountaintop experience, and immediately finds a disappointing lack of faith. And he says, how long must I put up with you? People close to you will lack faith. You know, in 1989, I was taken out of the ministry. We planted a region in uh, Rockford, Illinois. Cameron and I had taken a a small group of people from Chicago to Rockford, Illinois. And uh, it was slowly growing. And then I was asked to give up my dream for the ministry. Which is the point was my dream. It wasn't God's dream. God's dream is not always our dream. Don't get the two mixed up. Everything in me wanted to leave the church. Wanted to give up. You know, Joel was just an infant at that point. Um, I'd just come back from a life-changing month in India. Um, I was fired up, and then I heard this news, and my faith hit rock bottom. I was struggling. But, you know, I considered the consequences if I gave up. 
I thought of Kama. And uh, Kama would, at the very least, struggle with her faith. And at the worst, she would give up on God as well. Wow. And I thought about Joel and any other kids that we were going to have that would not have an opportunity to become Christians. You know, I think sometimes we make decisions without thinking about the consequences. Come on. You know, we make decisions and thinking that they're not important decisions. We think, oh, yeah, I'm missing church. That's not a big deal. Um, you know, it's, it's, if I don't have a quiet time for a few days, that's not a big deal. Come on. You know, if I, uh, if I don't give my full tithe, if I don't give everything that I've committed to God, it's not going to hurt anyone. You know, if I leave God, I'll eventually get over it. You know, I think sometimes we make these decisions thinking that they're, they're not important. And uh, you've always got to remember, every decision you make today is always going to have a consequence tomorrow. Wow. Uh, in your life, in the lives of others, in the lives of your loved ones, uh, every decision you make, today is going to impact them. So choose wisely. Come on, bro. Don't make decisions that you're going to regret oh, in the future. God. Don't don't make stupid decisions that are going to lead you down a road and lead others down a road that you don't want them to go. You know, I spent many, many hours crying out to God. Um, I went out in this this field, and I just, hours, just yelling and screaming and crying to try to get my, try to get my, my thoughts and my heart back into where God could use me. And uh, I felt like my dream was, God, was gone, but then I, I learned the lesson. I learned the lesson that my dream isn't God's dream all the time. Yeah. That God had a different journey for me. Yeah. You know, your journey with God may not look like what you want it to look like. But it's still a journey. Yeah. And God can still use you powerfully. People are going to struggle with their faith, guys. In fact, uh, they may hang, they, they may need to hang their faith on you. You may need to be their faith until they can get their own, but that's okay as long as they keep fighting. You know, in Luke 9, 46, after spending time loving the disciples, Jesus comes in and finds them, finds them uh, arguing who is the greatest. Again, for leaders, this is the battle. Uh, you've got to keep your heart pure from competition and entitlement. Yeah. You know, there are going to be discouragements. People will let you down. You're going to feel unappreciated, not believed in, uh, like you're pouring your life into someone and they're not responding. Situations will let you down. You may feel overwhelmed this morning. You may just feel overwhelmed. And uh, the burden of life is weighing on you. You may feel tired of fighting, but uh, it, it, Satan will do anything and everything to drag you down. But don't give into it. Yeah. Don't give up. The key to overcoming disciple, uh, discouragement is very simple. It's one word. Gratitude. Yeah. Gratitude is how you get over Discouragement. Got to change your mindset. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and, and 3 through 4. We won't go there, but just read it. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught his disciples to be thankful for what they have. Yo, know, in Luke chapter 17, 17 through 18, the story of the 10 lepers. Jesus heals 10, but only Nine of them return, or only one returns to thank him. Jesus says, where are the other ten that I cleansed, or the other nine that I cleansed? 
You know, in, uh, in the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, uh, 29, Jesus teaches that those who are grateful for what they have will be given more. You know, guys, Jesus had a goal. It was a journey that led him to bear a cross in Jerusalem. And it took the heart of a warrior. Let's finish in Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13 and verse 31. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, Roger. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, You go tell that fox. Tell I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today, tomorrow, and the third day. I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day. For surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. You know, if we're going to reach our goal, the goal of winning as many as possible, it's going to take nothing less. We've got to battle and overcome temptation. We, uh, we've got to allow rejection not to discourage us and drag us down, but rejection to train our hearts in how to deepen our love for people. And we overcome discouragement. We overcome discouragement with gratitude. Satan is going, he's going to try to get our attention and drag us down any way he can. You know, Proverbs 10.25 says, When the storm is swept by, the wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm for other. Guys, we need to have the heart of a warrior. You know, the next time Satan whispers to you, you cannot withstand the storm. The warrior in you needs to whisper back, I am the storm. Amen. Amen.